let's talk about how we're going to learn our modern architecture on AWS here. So instead of me rattling off documentation like a bad chatbot, <laughs> what we'll do instead is build this thing out organically. What? I don't mean like removing processed foods or something from it. <laughs> what I mean is that, yeah, we could go ahead and start with auto-scaling server fleets and containerization, but that's not a realistic flow. You see, if you were starting this application from scratch with little knowledge of what it will become, let alone how to work with AWS, you know, you're not gonna start off with the, the magnum opus of infrastructures. Instead, you're probably going to start with something like this. Just your computer to start writing code on and some users that you'd ultimately like to use whatever it is that you're building. And so our approach here is going to be to start simply. What's the first thing you need to do? Well, you'd probably need to code your application or service, and then you'd probably need to make it so that teams can work on it together. After that, you'd need a server to let people actually connect to it, and then of course, a database to persist anything that your application needs to save, and so on. However, you probably wouldn't start off with a containerized continuous deployment pipeline. <laughs> and when do you even need that? Why would you even do it? That's the reason we're taking this approach. I want you to see the decision-making and the whys behind setting up version control, configuring centralized logging. You know, what pain or need or cost creates a situation where you'd naturally arrive at setting something like those things we've just mentioned, setting those things up. Because this is how we build real systems in real life. And so this is how we're going to build out this architecture. Now, what we'll ultimately wind up at will look like this. An entire architecture that diagrams the flows of both developers pushing new updates uh, to your application's code and how clients and users access that application and, and what's going on in the background. We'll talk about the tools in general and also the services that we recommend to get the job done. Now, as I've said, we're not gonna go into the technical nitty gritty. You know, we're here to talk about strategy, tactics, and the authentic reasons behind the choices we make and the tools we select. Because I'll make links to every service and tool we mention available, I'm not gonna waste time reading the documentation definition of each thing. We want to build a map that can show you how to navigate cloud architectures and, and give you a compass of principles so that you can think independently. So let me go ahead and answer a question you might already have. What type of applications is this architecture for? Well, the short answer is 80%, 80 to 90% of applications out there. Why? Well, because this architecture is the general pattern for almost any web-based application or service. And just in case you wanna ask why again, let me ask you a question. How different is any given web application from the next one? Think about that. Oh, they all need servers. They all need a database. They all need static storage. They all need, well, a lot of the same things. Even if you go to the application code itself, sure, we have our custom code, but the majority of the total code is going to be the underlying language, frameworks, interpreters, et cetera. And so if you think about it, what makes any given web application different from another one objectively speaking, is rather small. And when we take this to hosting, scaling, infrastructure, you know, the differences are even smaller. Because of this, the architecture we're going to cover can be applied to most things. You know, not only because of what we just talked about, but because in our age nowadays, you know, pretty much everyone has a web application of some sort. Okay, now, one last thing. Because this architecture is so flexible and universal, it is absolutely worth learning. You know, for years I brushed all this stuff off, primarily when I was programming. I thought, ah, I don't, I don't need to learn this stuff. Plus it'll probably change by the time I'm done learning it. <laughs> now, obviously, as you know, that wound up uh, really biting me uh, later on. But the thing is this, if you learn this stuff, the web is no longer mysterious. When you can truly take an application end to end, things just make so much more sense. You know, if you're strictly a developer or strictly operations, it can be pretty difficult to see the whole picture. And if you can't see the whole picture, 
well, your ability to innovate and create new things will be a bit handicapped. But the second thing is a major reason why this stuff is so useful. It's evergreen. What? What I mean by that is the stuff we're going to talk about doesn't radically overhaul itself every couple of months. <laughs> Just like how the SQL language has stayed the same for decades, the way you build out cloud architectures will also stay quite stable. And as technologists, investing in skills that, oh, you know, don't have an identity crisis every few months is how we can create some stability for ourselves. And of course, when you take all of this and add to it uh, the fact that companies want more and more and more cloud, you know, even though I'm pretty sure half of them don't even know what they mean when they say that. <laughs> but because of this, it's one of the best things you can add to your skill set.